rated X. Welcome to the Launchpad Podcast. Motherfucker! Today on this album review podcast, we will be covering Tool and their debut EP, Opiate. So we're going to dig into some notes on how the band got together, a little bit of detail track by track, a few notes about musical patterns on certain tracks. So here we go. Tool formed in 1990 during the final days of hair metal mania. Bands like Guns N' Roses, Poison, and Skid Row were firmly settled in the mainstream and had a style that was a far cry from the musical efforts of Tool. Hair metal bands at the time were, for the most part, known equally for their image as much as their musical output, and that would prove to be a major opposition to the strategy that Tool would implement. At the time of formation, hair metal was just past its peak, and while it was still the prevalent force in American rock music, Different musical acts started emerging that would soon dethrone hair metal from being the mainstream force that it was in the past. The up-and-coming musical consensus would gravitate towards the grunge and alternative scene, and Tool would become one of a handful of bands to fill the void. Tool's focus would be strictly on the music, and they were adamant from the start that they would not use their image to push the band. In fact, Tool has mostly shied away from the the by-the-book forms of promotion that most bands participate in. They have limited their appearances in music videos, press, and also have declined to do major interviews. We're a lot older than most most of uh, the people that were, like our contemporaries, I guess, you know, like musicians that are coming up now. We're a little bit older. And uh, I think the difference is that some of them still believe that there's like an answer you know, because they're younger and they don't, they haven't gotten to the point, you know, of us old cynical curmudgeon-like bastards and realize there aren't really any answers, it's just, there's just means to get through this shit. Sorry. Maynard James Keenan moved to L.A. after getting out of the military. At first, he worked as a pet store manager. Danny Carey originated from Kansas, but then moved to Los Angeles and played with some high-profile names, such as Carol King. Adam Jones was from Illinois and was working in the special effects field on jobs such as Terminator 2, Batman Returns, and Edward Scissorhand. Paul Damore was a known guitar player from Washington. Like Adam Jones, Damore was living in Los Angeles because of his wish to enter the film industry. Maynard and Danny Carey lived in the same building. Maynard states in his book that he and Danny bonded after having to fight off bums and drug addicts to keep them from sleeping in their parking lot. They would race down with baseball bats in hand and handle the situation. Danny claims that after witnessing Maynard's screaming and physical demeanor towards the trespassers, that this is when he knew Maynard could be a rock and roll frontman. Adam Jones had a friend, Gloria, who started dating a guy who was originally from Boston. This turned out to be Maynard. They became instant friends. Adam and Maynard would frequently attend Green Jello gigs, and at the time, Danny Carey was featured in their lineup on drums. Jones and Keenan always joked about putting a band together, and with Keenan newly unemployed from his pet store job, it freed up time so they could form this band that they often discussed. They thought it was something fun to do, and held no aspirations of becoming famous or successful. They were originally set to audition a drummer who had prior success with 80s band Autograph. He never showed up to the tryout and did not even contact them back. Then they called Danny Carey to fill in. Danny was impressed with how they sounded and suggested they keep playing together and joined Tool full-time. Paul Damore became Tool's bassist after one of Adam Jones's friends in the special effects field, told him that he knew a guitar player that was sick of playing guitar and wanted to play bass instead. The band was signed to a record deal with Zoo Entertainment and was encouraged to release an EP with their heaviest six 
songs. The popular and often discussed tool logo is a heptagram, which is a seven-pointed star that is a positive symbol in sacred geometry. Seven is a commonly used number in religious and mystical symbolism, including the seven chakras in Buddhism. Seven is also the number that neo-pagans give to the realm of fairy, and Christianity also uses seven as the number of Jesus Christ and creation. Many fans consider Opiate to be Tool's heaviest album. The album was produced by Sylvia Massey and Steve Hanskin. Steve Hanskin was actually the former bass player of punk band Minor Threat. Most of the songs on 1992's Opiate were actually written at the same time as the songs that would soon to be released on their debut full album, Undertow. That came out a year later. The album, Opiate, is actually named after a quote by Karl Marx. And the quote is, Religion is the opium of the masses. The EP features straightforward song structures in place of the more progressive traits the band became known for later on in their career. Lyrical subjects explored on Opiate include censorship and organized religion. It seems to be really important that, you know, maybe you make it on college radio or stuff like that, but that you don't have like a, a top 40 hit on, a, you know, an AOR station or anything like that. Is that how you see yourselves as well? I don't, I don't know if it's actually a conscious effort. I just think that there's just a place where we come from and what we, what we understand as being art and something that has substance to us that doesn't fit into that scheme. So I don't think that that'll ever be a problem for us or it's, it's not even a consideration, you know, trying to stay away from it. We just, it just won't happen because it's just not what we're at, it's not what we are. It, it, I mean, it could, but if it did, it would be more by accident. And we play the music that we feel like playing, you know, and that's pretty much where we stand. That's why we do it. So that gives you a little background history of the album. Now we're gonna get into the review song by song basis now. I'm only going to gloss over a few kind of meanings and stuff of the song. I think it's best for everyone to kind of dig into it themselves, a little bit of their own interpretation, just give you an idea of my thoughts and kind of pick apart a couple cool points about the tracks. A lot of the lyrics were actually written in a lot of metaphor and double entendres to kind of make it tougher to really pick apart what they're saying. They definitely do not try to do anything easy and obvious, so let's dig into it. The first song off the album is Sweat. Now, Sweat, it was a great song to kick off the album. It features a flurry of dark riffs, a uh, tremble heavy bass. Danny plays a double kick pattern at different parts of the song, which is pretty badass. The lyrics and vibe of the song contain some parallels to Edgar Allan Poe's poem, A Dream Within a Dream. Um, I'm not sure how many people have necessarily picked up on that. Sweat seems to dramatize a confusion in watching the important things in life slip away. Uh, realizing you cannot hold on to even one grain of sand. The second song on the album is Hush. Now, this was actually the first single released. And they also did a music video for this, which was their first one ever. The song itself touches on censorship and settling out. It is also rumored to have been written in response to Tipper Gore, the wife of Al Gore, who was responsible for going before Congress to petition that record labels use the parental advisory sticker that many of us are aware of nowadays. That way they can notify parents of potential sexual and violent content in an album's subject matter. It was the first song that helped establish the band's reputation. Uh, the video was filmed in black and white, with the band appearing naked in a white room with tape over their mouths. Signs are shown over the genitalia that read parental advisory, explicit parts, a parody of parental advisory, explicit content. Toward the end of the music video, the band members are seen foaming at the mouth through tape and eventually remove the tape off their mouths. Hush, to me, was one of the more direct songs in all of Tool's discography, and it captures Maynard at his most aggressive lyrically and vocally. I enjoyed the kind of slightly distorted, funky bass riff a lot. I thought that was a cool little vibe to the song. It's one of my favorites off the album. I think a lot of people who have been sheltered all their lives and ignored realities tend to uh, not really understand 
the ugly sides of nature as being necessary and, and present. And uh, I think it's unfortunate. I think there, I think there are essential elements to grow. It's been sort of said about you punch out for real horrific images, and yet you're these really nice, normal guys who love pets. But why do you have such a, a punch out for horrific album covers? You know, dark, uh, bizarre videos. I think uh, most of us grew up in a pretty sterile environment. A lot of that stuff just wasn't around. It's all pretty much peaches and cream, you know, flowers. Everything's nice. Ignore all the bad stuff. And uh, it's just, the world's just not like that. And I think that the sooner people get to the point where they realize that the ugly stuff is just as important as the beautiful stuff, it goes hand in hand. I think that we can get on with evolving. Do you find uh, beauty in horrific images? Yeah, yeah, definitely. How so? It's just there, you know? It's a part of reality, it's a part of life. Birth, death, light, dark, it's just, it's just there. The third song on the album was Part of Me. Now, this was actually my least favorite song on the album. Um, not a bad song by any means. You know, some good guitar parts, solid drumming, rhythm section was tight. I just didn't connect with it as much lyrically as I do with other songs on the record. It has a quiet, loud, quiet format. It's also in an odd tempo, probably by design to make you feel uneasy. Because Tool is a band that they try to uh, extract emotions out of you. It's not about just listening to the song for entertainment. They're trying to get an emotional response from you. The next song on the album was Cold and Ugly. This one was actually recorded live on New Year's Eve 1991 at the loft that Maynard and Danny used to live at. I thought the choice to have the live song, this one and there's one other live song on this album, I thought that was genius. Because a lot of bands on their debut album have real trouble harnessing that live sound that they start developing a little bit of a following for. They have a tough time getting that down on their initial debut album. So just to slap some uh, live tracks on the album already, I thought was a good move. Now also on this song, I always, every single fucking time I listen to this, I crack up. Because the intro is Maynard talking to the audience, or probably the security guard. And he says, throw that Bob Marley looking motherfucking wannabe out of here. Then Adam Jones just goes right into that powerful riff that just kicks you in the fucking teeth. The song is stone cold proof that from the first album, Tool has always had a visceral power, especially visceral live power that very few bands can actually capture. Paul Damore really shines on this track for a former guitar player who just recently transitioned to playing bass. He really puts forth this filthy-ass bass line that just perfectly complements the playing of his bandmates and is possibly my all-time favorite bass track from him. Uh, the next song on the album is Jerk Off. This was the second song that was recorded live New Year's Eve 91 that was put on the album. It's quite possibly my favorite guitar riff on the album. Um, Adam Jones kicks absolute ass on this fucking song. Um... Once again, it has a funny-ass intro from Maynard. Um, he says something like, There used to be a bunch of assholes that lived in this building right here, but we systematically removed them like you would any termite or roach. This song, Jerk Off, is one of the most intense vocals of Maynard's whole fucking career. Uh, we're not just talking about Tool. We're talking about A Perfect Circle, Pussifer. This is some of his most intense vocal work. I really like the lines in the song consequences dictate our course of action and it doesn't matter what's right it's only wrong if you get caught if consequences dictate my course of action i should just play god and shoot you myself you can really hear in this track the frustration and determination of a mid-20s maynard who has been through challenging trials and who sees weakness in the people situations and society around him the final track on the album is Opiate. Now, Opiate has held regular position on Tool's live set list since it came out. Maynard actually dedicated this song to psychologist and author Timothy Leary on multiple occasions. Timothy Leary was very well known for the 60s kind of psychedelic movement. He was one of the pivotal characters when that was all going on. This song is my favorite on the whole album. It holds great meaning and it's well executed. 
incredible musicianship all around. The whole band really shines very well on this. Danny Carey's drums are just straight up hypnotic on this track. Some raw screams from Maynard Jones' his guitar work. It's like real droning on this, really sucks you in. The song is led with Paul DeMora's bass harmonics. Maynard James Keenan talked about the meaning of the song on one of the interviews he did. And he stated, My views against religion in general are with the middlemen, those who are in power and use religion as a market force by which to manipulate human beings for their own personal gain. The album, after all, was just an EP. That's all the songs on the album. Very short listen. It's hard to pick a favorite song, but Opiate would probably be it, then probably Jerk Off and Cold and Ugly. So wrapping up, after this album came out, it went on to achieve platinum status. Sold over one million albums, a very successful debut album, and it was both a critical and commercial success. And to give it a rating, I would easily give it a 9 out of 10. I mean, there's not a single bad song on the album. A lot of the tracks are really, really good. For this to be a debut album, it's totally kick-ass. Any band would be proud of putting this out as their first album. I mean, Opiate comes out swinging from the start and is from beginning to end an engaging listen. To the tool detractors who say their songs tend to be too long and drawn out, uh, those assessments do not apply to this album. I feel it's a perfect album, actually, to introduce somebody to the band that may have never heard anything outside of their well-known singles or, or maybe don't like some of their more progressive 13-minute songs and stuff like that. Opiate is a solid album and a really fun way to spend 27 minutes. Sometimes I think in people's in growing experiences, they tend to, to catch light of something that maybe the people around them didn't, didn't get to... To understand and in some cases I think that kind of understanding rather than it helping a person ends up hindering them in the face of everyday realities and then procedures and stuff it just ends up being a burden you know like the kid growing up too fast just ends up kind of messing them up a little bit I'm not saying that they shouldn't have those experiences I just think that they should be dealt with better I don't know this is the 